our eyes can't see in the near-infrared part of the spectrum, but our instruments can. Here's the absorption pattern of lots and lots of carbon dioxide, dark lines in characteristic patterns at specific frequencies. You'd detect a different set of infrared lines if, say, water vapor were present. If Venus were really soaking wet, then you should be able to determine that by finding the pattern of water vapor in its atmosphere. But around 1920, when this experiment was first performed, it was found that the Venus atmosphere seemed to have not a hint, not a smidgen, not a trace of water vapor above the clouds. And so instead of a swampy, soaking wet surface, it was suggested that Venus was bone dry, a desert planet with clouds composed of fine silicate dust. But later, Spectroscopic observations revealed the characteristic absorption lines of an enormous amount of carbon dioxide. So, some scientists thought there must be lots of carbon compounds on the surface, making this a planet covered with petroleum. Others agreed that the atmosphere was dry, but thought the surface was wet. With all that CO2, it had to be carbonated water. Venus, they thought, was covered with a vast ocean of seltzer. Now... The first hint of the true situation on Venus came not from the visible or the ultraviolet or the infrared part of the spectrum, but from over here in the radio region. We're used to the idea of radio signals from intelligent life, or at least semi-intelligent life, I mean, radio and television stations, but there are all kinds of reasons why natural objects should emit radio waves. One reason is that they're hot. And when, in 1956, Venus was for the first time observed by a radio telescope, the planet was discovered to be emitting radio waves as if it were at an extremely high temperature. But the real demonstration that the surface of Venus was astonishingly hot came when the first spacecraft penetrated the obscuring clouds of Venus and slowly settled on the surface of the nearest planet. 